Do, 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 do. Hello, people. Jump on here. Coffee is optional because we already had coffee. But I wanted to share something funny with you that's sort of developing right now. You're going to you're going to get this you're going to get this minutes after I realized what was happening. So this one's kind of funny. Um so you, you may be aware that I did a Dilbert comic on the topic of climate science recently. And it's uh, predictably it's uh caused a ripple in the universe and it's being passed around at all the big climate change experts and pundits. I think I think everybody in the business has seen it by now. And what I did in this comic is something I do often, and this might be the first time that I've ever admitted this, but lots of times I create the comics to uh, trigger cognitive dissonance, <laughs> and this is the best example of it. Um, so what I did was, it was a comic about climate science in which there are typically two sides. Yes, it's a problem. No, it's not a problem. Now, there are lots of little variations in between, but basically there's the, it's a big problem, and then there's the, it's not a pro big problem crowds. So what I did to trigger cognitive dissonance, entirely intentionally, is uh, I started out like it was going to be a regular climate science comic, and I would end up in one of those two camps, but in the end, Dilbert ended up making fun of economic models because the end of the, sci of the, the scientific, uh, let, let's call it the climate models, is that you say something's going to change in the environment, but you still don't know if you care about that until you take the next step, which is the economic model. So I'm making fun of the economic models, and I'm saying it as clearly as you can in the comic, and I'm doing it intentionally because I know people won't be able to hear it. In other words, I'm doing, I'm doing very much what a magician does. It's, it's misdirection. So I've created a situation where people, by the eighth panel of my comic, I'll, I'll remind you what it looks like. I won't read it to you, but so, you, so you can, well, well, I will read it to you. What the heck? All right, so just reminding you. I invited a climate scientist to explain the risk of climate change to our company. Uh, human activity is warming the earth and will lead to a global catastrophe. Dilbert says, how do scientists know that? So far, no controversy, right? But you think, well, he's either heading toward saying climate change is real or it's not. That's what you think. So I, I'm setting you up here, creating a pattern that's going to be violated. The scientist says, it's easy. We start with basic science of physics and chemistry. Uh, then we measure changes in temperature and CO2 over time. So, so far I've said nothing that anybody would disagree with, right? So that's the trick. Uh, so far I'm pacing everybody, both sides. I've only said things they agree with. We put that data into dozens of different climate models and ignore the ones that look wrong to us. Now, if you think I'm going to be climate denier here, you think, wait a minute, he's, he's making fun of us. But I'm actually exactly describing the process that everybody agrees with. If, if a bunch of models are clustered in the middle and some of them are way too high or way too low compared to the other models, then they throw them out. And, and it's literally because they don't look right, because they don't know if they're wrong. Nobody can know. Nobody can know what the future is, right? They literally throw them out because they look wrong. And I'm not saying that's irrational. I'm just describing the process. So, so far, so look what I've done. I've started with, let's say, four, five panels where you can't possibly disagree. Then there's one where it's sort of a head scratcher. This is, you know, if this were music, this would be like a, you know, a, a change in the, well, uh, I don't know any musical terms, but th this is where I'm changing you right here. Then the scientist says, we take that output and run it through long-term economic models Here's the trick. There's the sleight of hand. You were expecting me to say scientific models or climate models, but I didn't. I said economic models. So now your brain, if you're in one of those two camps, and you're sure I'm talking in traditional terms about climate science, you can't see that word. 
That word economic, that really is the key to the comic, is invisible to you. All right? It's like a magic trick. I've misdirected your brain so you can't see it. So that by the time you get to the end, what if I don't trust the economic models? And look, I'm teasing you. I use economic again. The people, most of the people reading this won't see that word. It'll actually be invisible to them, in, at least in a cognitive sense. They'll just read right over it. And then the scientist says, who hired the science denier? And now you're all mad, like, uh-oh, what's, you know, wh which side am I on? Um, so like I said, I think this is the first time I've admitted, I've admitted in public that I do this intentionally. So th this is set up as a magic trick to make you not see the word economic because there's actually nothing in the strip that anyone on either side of the debate disagrees with. Nothing. <laughs> but but at least one side of the debate is pretty worked up and they and and they're pretty uh, they're pretty angry about it. <clears throat> so when they come after me, as they have, um, I was just looking I just tweeted an article that you should you should go look at. If you're interested in this phenomenon, look at the article I I just retweeted. It was actually written by a critic a critic of mine for many years. Uh, I, I gave him a name. He's such a persistent critic that I call him the bearded taint because he's this just horrible bearded guy who believes he's a scientist. Uh, and he, what he does is he misinterprets essentially everything I say and, and turns it into some weird, weird thing that he can criticize. So there, somebody tweeted an article in which they're like, yeah, <laughs> this guy, he's, he's really torn this cartoonist apart. Uh, but then you look at the article, and you, by the time you get to the end, you realize that he didn't see the word economic. His, his entire analysis is based on a cognitive blindness that I intentionally triggered. <laughs> I swear to God, I'm not making this up. I intentionally triggered that cognitive blindness like a magic trick, it's a regular it's a regular thing I do. Uh, so it would get people all worked up, and it would make them pay more attention to the actual point. Because once you're all done getting mad, you've thought about it. It's risen in importance in your head because you thought too much about it, and and then you look at it and you go, "Damn it, I do agree with that. The economic models are not reliable." And our decisions are made on the economic models. <laughs> we don't make decisions based on climate models, or we shouldn't, until we've translated them into, therefore, what is the economic cost of this of all this? Is it big or is it small? All right, but here, here's the funniest part. And this is the part I was going to get to. That was a very long way to get to my point. It turns out that the that there's a very famous scientist, I guess he's uh, on the alarmist side, who looks just who looks a lot like this this character, and so I'm seeing comments like this from this fellow who says uh, the precursor to the strip showing Scott Adams sees it as a systematic issue. He says, "Will man sue?" Man is the scientist, the climate scientist, who apparently looks a lot like this because he's a bald guy with a goatee. Now, pointing out. <laughs> that I have coincidentally drawn a famous climate scientist or just a climate scientist who looks a lot like, uh, well, I, you know, I don't even know what the real Bill, Bill Man looks like, which was going to be my point. I, uh, I don't even know who this guy is. Uh, what's his, is it Bill Man? What's his first name? Uh, climate scientist. Climate scientist man, M-A-N-N. -N. Oh, he looks, he does look like him. All right, I swear I'm just looking him up for the first time. So uh, on social media, people have convinced themselves that, that my character, I'll show it to you again because it's... Let's go back to my character. So, so here's the character I drew as a climate scientist. And this is just a random scientist-looking guy, all right? There, there was nobody in mind when I did it. But it turns out that one of the most famous climate, climate scientists is this guy. <laughs> oh, Michael Mann. 
Was it Michael Mann? Yeah, Michael Mann. And he looks he looks a lot like the comic. So so here's the funny part. Um so people are already talking about whether he'll sue me. <laughs> and I think I had some interactions on Twitter with him as well. And I don't really follow climate science, so I don't know who the big names in climate science are. And I, uh, I, I'd vaguely heard this name in connection with climate science, but I didn't know what he looked like. And uh, you know, I couldn't, I didn't even know which side he was on, really. Um, so it was a total coincidence, but it's become real by virtue of repetition <laughs> on the internet. So, uh, uh, yeah, he, yeah, Michael Mann is not, he's not the one I'm referring to as the, uh, the bearded taint. That's someone else. Uh, but coincidentally, the bearded taint does, <laughs> does look a lot like this. <laughs> uh, so anyway, this is how fake news gets started. Um, in a month, it will be sort of solidified on the internet as I'm making fun of Michael Mann in that cartoon. And it will just become a fact on the internet. Now, I'm not going to write it anywhere on the internet because people aren't going to be able to search for text on, on this because it's funnier if the, if the, if the rumor keeps, keeps going. So do me a favor, if you're hearing it here uh, that I was not thinking of Michael Mann when I made that comic, don't write it down anywhere on the internet because then it will be searchable. <laughs> it's funnier if we just keep this going. So I can tell you because they can't search the, the text within the, uh, the Periscope telestream. So just, so just keep it going. Just don't say anything. That's all. You don't have to say anything one way or the other because now you're the only ones who know that it's a complete coincidence. But let, let, let's, let's ride this thing. <laughs> let's see what happens. <laughs> uh. Oh, uh, you can replay it. The atmospherics of fun. Yeah, so also look online uh, anywhere that you saw that my climate change uh, comic being discussed. And, and you'll, see, you'll see cognitive dissonance from both sides. You're going to see the, uh, the people who are you know, anti-alarmists, the, the people that some would call deniers, saying, yeah, this guy is right on. But usually they think it's because I'm criticizing the science <laughs> instead of very clearly saying it's the economic models I'm, I'm talking about. And then the other side has a cognitive blindness in the other direction. Again, all of this is intentional. When I designed the comic, it was to create exactly this triggered cognitive dissonance. Uh, and so you've got two sides, both in cognitive dissonance, but for slightly different reasons, because neither side could see the word economic. It, it is actually hidden in plain sight twice. I put it in the last two panels as the, the most important word in both of those panels. And, um, but people are blinded by their cognitive biases that when they read it, they don't see the word. All right. Why were the deniers in cognitive? Because they thought I wasn't making fun of the economics of it. Uh, that's probably not true of all of them. But you'll, you'll see people who clearly think I was just making fun of the scientist uh, or the science, not the scientist so, so much. I was making fun of the scientist, but just in, in terms of calling everybody a denier, no matter, no matter what the nature of their skepticism. So there were, there were many layers to that comic, but uh, the most important layer was designed to be invisible and yet completely visible at the same time. That was the fun of it. All right. What do you want to talk about, Trump? I think I talked about him enough in my earlier one. Do you think Trump will be impeached? Not based on anything that we we've heard of so far. Um, so do you remember, let me, let me take you back in time. Do you remember, I think it was May of 2016, there was a Jake Tapper interview, uh, 
and um, President Trump was asked, you know, something about disavowing the KKK and David Duke, and he gave a sort of a, I didn't hear the question, non-answer, unsatisfying, what the hell are you saying? Did you just not disavow the KKK? So there was some, some discussion about whether he heard the question correctly, but the point is, how did you feel after that happened? Did you think he had any chance of recovering from that? Just take yourself back. Remember after that broke, did you think he had any chance of recovering from that? No. So now that you look at it with um, some distance, oh, some of you did, okay. Um, but if you look at it with some distance, uh, it feels like it was just a, a blip. Then there was the Khan boner where he said something about the Khan family and that looked like the end of him, but it wasn't. And then what about the, yeah, the Access Hollywood tape? I was getting to that. I was working my way up to that. So when the Access Hollywood tape broke, didn't you think it was game over? Didn't you feel like, oh God, he's, he's done? <laughs> um, some people didn't. But but the feeling that people are having right now about, oh, God, oh, God, he's in such trouble, um, everybody's talking about uh, impeachment, what you're seeing is the other side using a Trump trick, um, at least a, a famous persuasion trick that he also uses. Think about it. Every time you hear the word impeachment, what is the persuasion trick that you're hearing? Go ahead. Answer the question. What is the persuasion trick every time the Democrats use the word impeachment? Even if they're saying, I don't think it's coming to impeachment, impeachment, impeachment. It's reposition for sure. He's making you, uh, they're making you think past the sale. All right. They're making you think past the sale to the issue of whether whatever it is he's done rises to the level of impeachment. But guess what? We don't know what he's done. <laughs> we don't know what he's done. That's the whole point. That's the, that's the reason there's a special counsel, right? We're trying to figure out if the suspicions about him are true. But when the Democrats um, mention, well, this is you know, Nixon-like impeachment territory, some of it is just politics because you, you go to whatever is the bad thing. But think about how powerful that is. It makes you think past the question of whether he did anything wrong, or at least anything of substance, and you get right to the question of, well, once it's in court, are they going to impeach him for these crimes? What crimes? <laughs> crimes haven't, there hasn't been any demonstration of any crimes. <clears throat> so it's, it is really good persuasion from the other side. It's coordinated, it's persistent, the repetition, the thinking past the sale. It's also a bit of an anchor. <clears throat> All right, so in this case, it works. It's two different persuasion techniques combined. <clears throat> when you say the worst case scenario, which is impeachment, that takes your mind so far into, oh my God, oh my God territory, that you easily now can accept that he did something really bad that might be short of impeachment territory, but God, we don't want this guy to be our president, right? So they've got, uh, they're setting this first, sort of a first offer anchor of impeachment. They're making you think past the sale. They're repeating it endlessly. And then here's the best part. There's, there's so much uh, Russia, Russia stuff in so many different ways, and they're all complicated, and they're you know, not quite what you think. They've also added confusion. So when you have confusion, people will gravitate to simple explanations. So if I confuse you by saying, oh, Russia, Russia, Trump, 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 Russia, it's in his Comey interviews, it's in the Flynn thing, it's in, it's in his meeting in the office where he gave up a secret. It's like, there's Russia everywhere, and his son-in-law, and they've got business ties, and what about his taxes? All right, when you're done with all that, your brain is like, I, I, I don't know what to do with all this. Because there's not like one of those things where you can latch on and say, yeah, forget about all the others. If he did this one thing, and it sounds like he did, you know, he, he's dead to me, right? It doesn't have that. 
It has just a whole bunch of things. So it's confusion. So when you have confusion, people will gravitate to the simplest explanation. Is the simplest explanation of you know, seven different Russia-related collusion stories that he didn't do anything? Or is the simplest explanation that he did and he's going to get impeached? Now, forget about what's true, because Occam's razor is for suckers. The simplest explanation is never is almost never true, because the simplest explanation is whatever you think is the truth. Ask me what I think is true about any topic. I'll explain it to you, and I'll also tell you that my explanation is the simple one. Ask the next guy what he thinks is the, is the situation anywhere on any topic. He'll tell you his opinion, and then you say, is yours the simplest explanation? You'll go, God, yes. And it's completely different from mine. Occam's razor is for fools, right? In some scientific context, it makes sense. But in common sense, in the world of trying to figure out politics or your life, <laughs> It's a trap. You know, the simplest explanation is the one that your stupid brain came up with. Because the real world is pretty complicated, and there are a lot of variables in play. And you can't hold all that shit in your head, right? So the simplest explanation is usually the sucker's play. I'm sure I had some point after that, but... Um, yeah, and the simplest explanation here is people are going to say, um, I don't like Trump. I hear a lot of stories that are very complicated about Russia, and there are lots of them, and I can't sort them out, and I can't make any determination if they're somehow all cumulatively powerful, like a, you know, like some kind of a, you know, a court case made out of circumstantial evidence. If you have enough of it, you can actually make a case. It's just really, really hard. But my God, there's so much of it. There's so much of this Russia stuff. What do I do? What do I do? What's my simplest explanation? Because I'm not very smart and I can't sort out all these details. What's my simplest explanation for a person who already doesn't like Trump? He's going to get impeached. Simple. There must be there must be fire where there's all this smoke. <laughs> But in this case, all this smoke appears to be confirmation bias. Uh, you know the saying, uh, where there's smoke, there's fire? Let me tell you where else there is smoke. There's smoke wherever there's confirmation bias. If you think there's a fire happening right now, and you look out the window and you see steam coming out of a factory, because that's just where the steam comes out of the factory, you're going to be pretty sure it's a fire. All right, so where there's smoke, there's fire, sometimes, sometimes. Far more often, probably, I don't know how you'd measure such a thing, but my sense of it is, far more often, where there's smoke, there's you using Occam's razor incorrectly, or confirmation bias has made you see a bunch of smoke where there wasn't any, right? <laughs> um, do what are the odds? I just gave you an example for those of you who've been here a while. What are the odds that I would draw a comic strip on climate science that would feature a character who looks exactly like one of the most famous climate scientists, Michael Mann? What are the odds? So you would say, okay, where there's smoke, there's fire. All right, that's. You, you see this Adams guy blogging about climate science in ways that this Michael Mann guy wouldn't like, apparently. I don't know exactly where he stands on all this stuff. Um, but if you see, you see all these evidence, all these different ways that I've said things that you interpret wrongly, usually, that you know I, I've got a skepticism about the climate science, and most of that would be wrong, by the way, uh, <laughs> because I've intentionally triggered cognitive dissonance in, in a lot of what I write and do. If you thought of that, you'd say, look at all that smoke. And then, and then he makes a comic that looks exactly. All right. What are the odds that I would have a comic that looks exactly like this guy who happens to be a climate scientist? What are the odds? Where there's smoke, there's fire. <laughs> no. Now, what about Occam's Razor? It's a comic about a climate scientist. I make a comic strip 
that usually mocks you know things that are happening in real life. It's exactly looks looks just like the real life guy. What's the simplest explanation? What is Occam's razor? The simplest explanation is that you know I drew it based on this guy. This is why Occam's razor is a fool's trap. Because if you ask me what's the simplest explanation, here's my, my explanation of the simplest explanation. I don't draw many different looking characters. And if you look through my history of my Dilbert comics, when I draw a science looking guy, he's usually some bald guy, and I just happen to throw a goatee on him because my CEO character is also a bald guy. And I thought, well, I'll make it a little different. Throw a goatee on him. All right. Now, is that more complicated than the th- or, or less complicated than the other explanation? It's subjective. Occam's razor. It's for fools. Don't fall for it. All right. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's actually a um, perfect example. Yeah, a lot of you don't know that. You might be hearing this for the first time. But, you know, when Trump did the impression of the guy with the bad arm and he, and he went like, oh, like that, uh, it turns out there were there were lots of uh, um, there, there were lots of videos of him mocking other people with the same expressions. And so once you see the context, it completely changes. Uh, is there a slot article on impeachment? Of course there is. <laughs> of course there is. Uh, oh, you want to talk about North Korea? What was that? It's like North Korea is getting pushed off the map here. North Korea needs to do something more interesting and new or else I can't get interested. But, you know, the one report I saw, and it was from some source I don't, I, I don't recall thinking it was credible, but I was looking for a confirmation of it, and maybe that's impossible, that North Korea had planned a nuclear test and China talked them out of it or threatened them out of it. Had you heard that anywhere? Um. <laughs> the arrow technique? What's that? <laughs> yeah, there's there's a Twitter user who calls himself Evil Scott Adams and uses my my photo just with a, an evil mustache painted on. And you know, normally, normally that would be bad. But the funny thing is, <laughs> here's why it's funny. He somehow either thinks exactly like I do, or he's read enough of my stuff to imitate it. And I think it's probably some combination of the two. And he looks like he might have some background as a psychiatrist or something, and he doesn't want to uh, doesn't want to reveal his identity. But quite often, the evil Scott Adams, the guy who pretends to be me with a, with a fake mustache, uh, enters Twitter conversations that I'm already in, and actually says things I was going to say. <laughs> so it's it's actually hilarious to me uh, how many times I'll see him respond to somebody exactly as I would have, because that's what he's trying to do, you know, sort of, sort of as a parody, maybe sort of as something else. I don't know exactly what's going on, but everything he says is both responsible. It seems technically accurate, as far as I could tell, you know, scientifically compatible, and very much what I would have said. So it's just sort of hilarious every time I see it. And I, I want to be mad at it, <laughs> that somebody is sort of pretending to be me, but in a in a parody sort of way. <laughs> but I can't be, because he does it so well. It's just hilarious. Uh, yeah, he's like my ventriloquist dummy. It almost makes me wish I had thought of creating... Uh, my own second account called Evil Scott Adams, so that I could you know do the do the do the more evil things. But he's not doing more evil things. He's actually just uh, being funny. Do you know what a taint is? Of course I do. Yeah, you can def- Oh, uh, try this at home. Yeah. So somebody said he's gonna 
show my climate change comic to an environmentalist friend and see what see if it can uh, induce cognitive dissonance. Here's how you test that. All right, this is cool. You can all do this. If, just find my Sunday comic from this most recent Sunday at Dilbert.com. It's easy to find. Um, show it to someone who's kind of big on the climate in the climate topic and see if it induces cognitive blindness for the last two panels. It was, it was designed to do that. So the way you test it is get the reaction to it, have them talk about it, and see if you can get them to say economic. Because if they miss the word economic, they've, they've missed the part that I've intentionally made blind to them by inducing confirmation bias and cognitive dissonance. You can't admit you love me to your friends. You probably shouldn't admit that anywhere in mixed company. Um, <laughs> so, so, so try it at home. Try that comic and see if you can get somebody to acknowledge that the last two panels are about economics without mentioning it first. And if they just get mad that you're that it's, that I'm a science denier, then you feel cognitive dissonance. And then say to them, "Did you notice?" That he's not he's not criticizing science anywhere in the strip. That he's only talking about economic models. See if you see if you can get him to recognize that after you've induced cognitive dissonance, and then watch watch their eyes. If you're in person, it's great in person, and just watch the um, the rebooting. I call it. Uh, every once in a while, you'll see a person reboot. And if you're not a hypnotist, you, you haven't seen this so many times. But it's that moment when somebody is faced with something that violates the reality and is also totally credible. So, for example, when they read the comic, the reality is that I wrote a, a science-denying comic. But when you say, did you notice the word economic here right in front of you that you're reading right now, and that that's changing everything about what you just imagined was your reality? Can you see that? That word is right in front of you. You can read. There it is. You do that to somebody, and you then watch their head, watch the eyes, and watch the face. And I can't do an impression of it, but when you see it, it once you've seen it enough times, you start to recognize it. It'll be, it'll be almost a, you'll see almost a deformity in the face, and then the eyes go. You, you, you'll actually see a facial change that looks like somebody's rebooting. It's like the robot rebooted their Because they're sort of reinterpreting their entire experience. And it takes a lot of brain power to do it. They're, they're rewriting the movie in your head. If you use my comic, the Climate Science comic from Sunday, for those of you new, just show it to your friend, have them react with cognitive dif dissonance to say that uh, he's a climate denier, he must be the guy who wrote this comic, and then point out the word economic in the last two panels and just watch their face. After, when, when you point it out, show it to them and then just look at the face. It's going to freak you out. Watch that. All right, I'll leave you with that. i got to go do some other stuff. Bye.